looks like we're we're getting back to almost the same amount of people that we had. Um, perhaps if you'd like to wait just another 20 seconds or so, Melissa, we're sure. still down about 10 people. I think we were at 93 before that happened. Yeah. Yeah. Hi everyone, welcome back. Um, apologies for that brief blip. We'll get started again in a couple of seconds as we just wait for the last people to rejoin. And um, I think now, uh, just, just for your information, Jake, um, you are now the host. So it's now all on you if we... Uh, <laughs> All right. Well, that's a big responsibility. So big responsibility. thank you. Thank you for telling me. So we're at 90. Should I start again, do you think? Yes, I think you can start again, Melissa. And sorry for that. <laughs> that's OK. Um, so I can't remember exactly where I was, but basically, um, so that's for our, um, we had a subgroup, a working group um, with many of the experts on this call and various experts that um, that helped us um, bring together this recommendation. Jatswa has various recommendations and um, software citation is, is one of them. So um, one of the, the key things that we, we realized that we had to do and we often have to do um, for Jatswa is, is to keep things simple because um, if you make it too complex, then people just won't be able to follow it and um, it kind of defeats its purpose. So we, in the end, we came to the conclusion that the only actual requirement for a software citation is to identify it as a software um, with an attribute and to provide an ID or a URL. So uh, this, this is key because as I was um, in my previous role at eLife, we'd been uh, tagging software citations with an attribute for a long, long time, but most people didn't know that they could do that or it wasn't kind of clear from the JATS documentation. And so simply, being able to identify a reference as software is kind of will take things on to a new level. Um, but obviously, there's a lot more granularity that can happen. So we provided enough of, of a recommendation so that users can be more granular in their own tagging if they want to. And um, the recommendation caters for that. And it also acknowledges the, the complexity in this field. So I know one of the things that we always used to struggle with at eLife was if you can't get an author um, for a GitHub uh, repo, for instance, and it, it acknowledges that that could happen and actually maybe using a, a username or a handle or something as an author is okay because it, it's still data, it's still something. Um, and also, you know, there are complex objects nowadays and it's like, are they software, are they data? It, it, it gets very tricky, but that's another thing about Jets for R is that we kind of don't editorialize at all. So it is very much the kind of basics of the tagging, but there's some information and, and guidelines and inf um, extra detail uh, um, either at the beginning of the reference, just to kind of help people along their way. So I think, that's me. The, my last slide is just about how to get involved in JATSWA. So everyone's welcome and we always um, appreciate anything, but I realise that we need to move on. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much, Melissa. And let's move on to Stefan. Thanks. You can hope you can all see my slides. Yep. Perfect. Thank you. So I'm uh, briefly going to talk about the citation file format and some new integrations it's uh, received over the last um, few months. Um, the issue that, or the problem that the citation file format tries to solve or tries to um, contribute to solving is that unlike uh, papers, um, software doesn't wear all the metadata that you need to cite it on its sleeve. So, um, the software itself usually doesn't bring, you know, information about name, authors, versions, etc. So um, the citation file format is a community format that tries to tackle this problem. Um, it's been in development um, since 2017. 
And it's a plain text file format um, implemented in YAML, which is something that software developers may know from configuration files, for example. And it's fairly easy to read and write by humans and machines. Um, the clear focus, uh, for, for example, as compared to code meta and other metadata, so metadata formats for software is um, citation and advanced citation and usability. Um, there is um, an ecosystem of tooling around the format for uh, you know, tools to create and, and convert the file format into other formats. And um, in the last year, um, it's seen some new integrations with a number of platforms. And I'm um, briefly going to talk about um, these integrations right now. So um, first up, we've had a great development from the Netherlands eScience Center. Um, who have developed a, a website called CFF init, which makes it easy for, for users that don't want to write those files uh, manually um, to just fill out the form and they can then download the file and um, put it into the, the, the repository because that's what where these files are, are meant to live. So that people that come, for example, to a GitHub repository for the software can easily find the citation information. And the major thing that's happened uh, in July this year is that um, our work with GitHub to implement some sort of software citation support in GitHub has come to fruition and GitHub has introduced a new widget that you can find on source code repositories on the platform and they provide um, a widget that basically takes the information from the citation file format file and renders it in a, a formatted string and also in BitTix so people can just copy and paste that to the, to the reference managers or straight into their their papers, etc. cetera. Um, there is also documentation. They get to provide a template so that when people create a new citation.cff file in GitHub itself, they are being provided with a template uh, that they can then change to, to suit their needs. Um, the good thing about this is that soon after GitHub has announced this feature, a number of other platforms followed suit and announced integrations. For example, Zenodo, and you may know that there is a, a link between GitHub and Zenodo so that when people create a release of their software on GitHub, they can activate the so-called GitHub Zenodo bridge. And this will uh, take any new release in the GitHub repository and pull over the source code to Zenodo. And the new integration with CFF means that whereas uh, before Zenodo would use GitHub uh, metadata to populate the record, um, for the software version that's being published. Um, Zenodo now uses the information that's being provided by the actual authors of the software, which we hopefully can assume to be um, more complete and hopefully uh, more correct, especially in terms of author lists, for example. So Zenodo uses the, the citations.cff information to populate records. And also um, some refer reference managers have um, started to integrate uh, the citation file format. So Tero, for example, um, which has a number of browser plugins, which provide a button in your browser where you can, if, if you browse to a publisher's website, et cetera, you can click this button and then um, Zotero will, will read the metadata that's being supplied by the website and add, it, add, add an item um, to your reference manager. And the same now works for GitHub uh, repositories um, via the citation.cff support. So all in all, um, this year has been some sort of inverted moon landing in that it's been one giant leap for the citation file format as a community format. Um, but I think it's been a small step for software citation, not a giant leap, because it's still, you could ask, is this the, is the citation format the optimal solution for all your software citation issues? No, it's certainly not. Um, but it does cover um, some ground and I think it'll help raise awareness. So hopefully, We'll see some more integrations coming up. There are some planned, some already implemented in Jabra, for example. And we're working in the, in the software citation hackathon around this conference to implement something in GitLab. We're also trying to uh, build a good governance um, model for the citation file format project as part of the digital infrastructure incubator at the Code for, uh, for Science and Society. And that's me, I think. Thank you. Thanks, Stefan. Um, let's move on to Jake next. Hi, 
sorry, I, I was muted. All right, so um, I was asked to um, sort of uh, address the barriers to um, trackable software citation. And I confess that um, I'm personally extremely optimistic. And so I don't, I don't know if I was actually the best person to ask about this, but um, basically, um, sorry, here, here's, here's what I would say. Um, the first thing that, that I would like to point out is that um, we looked at everything published in science in 2020, which was prior to um, the completion of the, the first journals task force that Dan mentioned when we, we published a paper in Faculty of a Thousand, and it was prior to um, Melissa's JATS for R working group, and it was prior to um, the integration, the, the more seamless integration with GitHub that, that you all just heard about in the prior talk. And even in that context, we had 12% of science papers citing a Zenodo DOI for software, and addition, excuse me, an additional 4% um, with a GitHub URL that they could have cited, but um, just uh, didn't because maybe it was embedded in the text somewhere. And um, formatting the citations is getting much easier, as, as you just heard in the prior talk, you know, and, and I think we benefit a lot from the fact that, um, you know, so many people already use GitHub. And so once there's a seamless process for turning your GitHub repo into a citation, that loops in, at least from our perspective at, at Science and um, a lot of other publishers I've talked to, um, if, if you are getting everything in GitHub cited, then that's a big proportion of what you want cited in the first place. So I think that that helps a lot. Um, my experience has been that getting software released in the first place is harder than getting it cited. Once we're dealing with authors that actually are, are prepared or even eager to release their software, then telling them to cite it has been relatively straightforward. Um, as I said, you know, especially because of the, the um, already existing GitHub to Zenodo integration. And so um, I just figured, I know it's not exactly the topic of this session, but you know, the, the typical objections we get to authors wanting to release their software, which is of course a prerequisite to citing it is they want to reserve exclusive use of it for their own work, or they um, want to commercialize it someday. They don't have permission from co-creators who don't happen to be authors on that paper, or they say they want to incorporate better commenting, which usually means um, you know they they really care more about the the first two points. But um, we and other publishers are are pushing hard on. Um, persuading authors, um, even if it's not open source, you know, then maybe at least make an executable available or, or um, something, something in between some sort of compromise. And um, as I said, you know, once we have reached an agreement with the authors that they're prepared to site to um, release their code, then I think, um, I think we're doing really well. And I should clarify that the that 16% um, up there um, obviously, there's there's a fair number of papers that science publishes that don't use code at all, and so I think that this is actually quite a respectable number relative to the the total number of papers that that we've published that are using um, custom software. So if I really wanted to be devil's advocate, you know, one of the things people will say is, oh well, you know, journals have reference limits, and and how are you going to account for that? And I think. Realistically, it's it's rare for papers to need more than a couple of software citations anyway, and so I don't think that that this initiative is really going to swamp the reference list. Confusing for copy editors. That, in my mind, was the biggest barrier. Um, that people are going to say, well, we don't really know how to format it, or we don't, um, you know. In particular, I think there was a there was a trackable in my remit, and um, obviously, you know, making it trackable is contingent on having a standard format that um, ideally either gets gets um, tracked by data site or or um, uh, otherwise you know has some metadata that people can search and I think that's exactly what the jazz for our working group was for and um, I, I I was a participant in that um, that group that Melissa ran and I think that we really amongst all of the publishers there I think we really hashed out a lot of the issues that could come up and so we're on very strong footing now to to go forward lack of community buy-in again I, I I have never really had an author say to me well you know I just don't want to cite this um I think it's something that once we suggest it to them they say sure um, there are indeed a lot of authors who like to include their GitHub URL directly 
Um, you know, even when we tell them that it's on the Zenodo landing page, they still say, well, I want someone to be able to click straight from the paper into GitHub. And, you know, in those cases, we say, okay, you know, you want to do that, you can put that URL in, but also include the citation. And so that's sort of how we've been getting around that. But, um, you know, as I said, I think that GitHub is doing a very good job of, of messaging and um, integrating the, these ideas. GitLab less so. Um, we're fortunate that at least in our author base, we see much higher adoption of GitHub than GitLab in any event. Um, so, but it is true that that some of the authors who use GitLab, th this aspect of it is a little more challenging. So um, is science unrepresentative because we only publish six journals. So maybe we're a little bit more hands-on, maybe. And again, you know, maybe that's the reason that I was sort of the enthusiast invited to, um, to present this, this weak counter argument. But what I would say is that we had really substantial broad representation of all of the big publishers, both on, on Dan's task force and on Melissa's. And, um, you know, I was there and we discussed a lot of these um, sort of uh, thorny process concerns. And my takeaway is that we are on very strong footing to, to make software citation an integral part of the publishing landscape. So um, as I said, you know, may, I, I'm not sure if that was what I was invited to say, but that's my honest perspective. Thanks, Jake. Um, so finally, we'll go on to Dana, and then we will start with some of the questions you've been putting in. Can't yet see your slides yet. I'm not sure what's going on, just a second. I'm going to try one more time and I might just share a different way. Can you see my slides now? No, not yet. Do you uh, want us to show them? Uh, if you could, that would be great. Are you able to share them, Dan? Yes, sorry, just I, I will in one second, just trying to get the right uh, window. Uh, okay. It's working. That looks good, thanks, Dan. Okay, so my apologies for technical challenges. I think despite COVID-19, putting us in this strange world for going on years. Uh, the technical difficulties will uh, become a theme in everything I'm saying anyway. So uh, nice non sequitur. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, plans that we have in place to uh, host a workshop where our goal is to develop an action plan that actually starts to um, kind of proactively address many of the challenges that we've either kind of covered thus far or alluded to. And I wanted to highlight before I got into what the goals are going to be of this workshop, uh, why hasn't it happened yet and who's going to be involved. Um, so the first thing I want to say is our goal with this really is to involve stakeholders from many different communities because in order to actually start addressing uh, these issues, we really need input from throughout the scholarly communication ecosystem and the digital preservation landscape. So Dan, if you could move on to the next slide. Um, um, but with that in mind, even though we need people from many, many different uh, perspectives, we have funding from the Institute of Museum and Library Services because some of the key stakeholders uh, in these, uh, these issues uh, include museums and libraries and archives and repositories more broadly uh, that tend to host software. So um, in order to cite software, you need to be pointing at something if you want to actually be able to access the software, which is one of the fundamental principles of software citation. So there's a strong argument to be made sometimes that you can't necessarily point to the software itself. And we can get into that, but I have five minutes, so I won't. Um, but uh, our goal is to really support that fundamental point at the software to enable access to the software as much as we're enabling credit to the software. And repositories and archives are a big stakeholder in this landscape because they typically uh, 
have the capacity to, or already do, ingest software into their holdings. Uh, but this is not always straightforward. There's a lot of issues that are um, kind of come up in this landscape because software is very rarely archived on its own in these contexts. So if you're not just depositing a software package in Zenodo, uh, you often might have embedded software, something like a Jupyter Notebook or the software itself um, is uh, kind of being deposited along with a paper. Um, there's just some complexity here. And so the funding from the Institute of Museum and Library Services is going to be used to bring together a group of people uh, from many different uh, perspectives, but particularly focusing on uh, libraries and the communities that they serve. So uh, next slide, please. Um, and our original plan uh, came about soon after the um, paper that Dan uh, pointed out was published in 2019, where we looked at the challenges of software citation implementation as the Force 11 working group. And uh, the goal was to have an in-person meeting where our attendees would outline how their approaches to these challenges could be converted into discrete actions. Uh, we would define what the hurdles were, uh, and then we would move on to explaining how our approaches would help or conflict with other approaches to the same challenges. So there's many different ways to address some of the same problems. And then we would move on to estimating the technical and other expertise, time and resources that were needed to address and execute the ideas. So the action plan would get to be um, something that we hoped would be really concrete and help reconcile all of these, these things together and in an in-person format so that we could go back and forth. Um, I think we've seen how difficult a virtual meeting can be. Um, so next slide, please. Um, and after uh, these steps were taken, uh, the idea is that we're going to evaluate and prioritize the ideas that address the common challenges and lay out a plan, the action plan. So the mutually supporting approaches that uh, would have to come together to actually execute these ideas. Uh, we start to identify leaders and other sources of funding that would still be needed to actually solve problems. So uh, that was the idea. Uh, COVID happened though. So uh, we bounced around for a whole year, actually, a few different ideas for how to do this kind of work in a distributed way virtually. And this in combination with a few other externalities uh, led us to kind of postpone for a year. So now we're back and COVID's still with us. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, although we are moving forward uh, and COVID is changing how we're going to go about this work, the goals are the same. So our plan right now is to move forward with a high hybrid meeting that we're, uh, that I'm thinking in my mind is being structured like a sandwich. So we want to do some of the same discussion work and to bring in as many uh, perspectives and stakeholders as we can to a series of virtual focus groups where we can have some conversations that will help out the issues and touch on all the points that I covered in my prior, prior slides. We'll then bring together a smaller uh, cohort of people to work in person using all of the information gathered from those focus groups. So where I am at, uh, we have only got so much capacity to host in-person meetings. So we are still going to try to bring together that uh, in-person group to um, flesh out a plan for where we move forward. And then that draft plan will actually be circulated to all participants so that we can refine it and move forward from there. And in this way, we're hoping to develop an actual action plan that goes about addressing some of the prior and then prioritized challenges from these different uh, perspectives. And Ideally, that report can then be used to approach institutions and funders and other stakeholders to start affecting change. So that's the plan now. And I think my time is up. Thanks very much, Dana. And I think that's a great place to finish on um, as a 
I look forward to the future and what we're, we'll be trying to do as part of this work in this community in 2022. Um, so thank you very much to all of the speakers. Um, I think that that gives a great perspective on where we've come from and where, um, where we've gone in 2021. It has been a hard year. It has been um, one where so much has been virtual, but uh, despite that, um, as hopefully you have seen, there's been a lot of progress in terms of providing guidance and recommendations for publishers and for um, formatting citations uh, at that level uh, with journals and trying to get guidance across there and also with um, software repositories and getting um, citation information metadata into those. So that sets us up now for the second part of this deep dive session. And I see there's been a number of different questions that have already gone um, into the chat and several of them have been answered around things like um, uh, understanding the adoption of citation file format, uh, whether reference managers are picking up citation for in, um, integration and also looking at how you better identify software citations and provide guidance on that. Um, I've been looking through the questions that were um, put in in terms of people's goals for the session and I think one, uh, one question that I think has not yet been fully answered which I'll put to the speakers is one that came in that asked um, are journals and societies, professional societies, starting to mandate software citation practices? So do you see that there's been a change in this? And um, which are the research fields that appear to be doing this best? So I wondered if um, maybe uh, Jake and Melissa, do you want to, to start off answering that? Jake, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, yeah, so as I said, you know, this is, um, I would say this is something that that's really come to the fore in the last two or three years. Um, part of it is that for reproducibility reasons, journals have been trying hard to convince authors to release the code in the first place. That's been an initiative. And, you know, as I mentioned in my talk, there's a little bit of pushback. And one of the arguments that we make to try to persuade authors that it's worthwhile is that if the release is um, concerted with a, a citation protocol, then that will help the software creators get individual credit. And so the idea is that rather than people only citing the paper itself, which has you know experiments and theory and, and various other components, by making a, a regular practice of citing um, software that's been used in a paper, then, then that will build a citation record. It will help those people get specific credit and, and it will um, it will be a, a useful a useful outcome for them that that hopefully will persuade them that you know why why it's worthwhile for them to release the code. And so um, I, I would say in the last certainly the last two years, we, we have seen a, a much bigger uptake um, on the part of authors who are doing this um, in part because it's gotten easier, um, you know, to just ship GitHub code straight to Zenodo and they give you a DOI and you, you put the DOI in the reference. Um, I would say that among the, the fields that we've dealt with that have been the best at it, we Science Magazine don't happen to publish a lot of computer science, but um, physics has been doing a very good job. Actually, the epidemiologists did a spectacular job of this. You know, we published a lot of COVID models and all of them were very good about signing their software. Um, you know, I think part of that had to do with the fact that there was a, a sort of priority among those people to share everything as, as seamlessly as possible. But I was very pleased to see, you know, that basically every single COVID paper we published had a software citation for the epidemiolo epidemiological model. So I thought that was, that was really um, reassuring. And I think that kind of goes back to the point you made that the challenge is perhaps persuading people to share and once they are willing to do that, then the citation part is now um, the easier step. Um, Melissa, do, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I was just going to say, because uh, the question was about kind of the 
publishers are doing this. So I've just had a quick scan of the Jets for our recommendation because that's that's a good kind of gauge of the number of publishers in, involved in that. And that there, there are a fair few that are interested. We had a lot of interest in it. We had comments on the recommendation and things like that. So yeah, I definitely think it is it's on the up. And Dan, um, obviously, as one of the co-chairs of the journals task force, what, what is your feel for what's required to help uptake amongst the, the journals which perhaps haven't started providing guidance yet? Yeah, so I, I was actually going to say that I think um, I think astronomy is a, is a very nice example of an area where things have worked pretty well. Um, and it seems like it's because the journals and the community and the indexers have all worked together, um, both in terms of research as well as in terms of just kind of making things work. Um, and so it's, I think it's, it, the, the fact though is that it's very community driven. Um, so so I, I feel like that's kind of the, the thing that's needed in a lot of areas is, right, is the, the community of researchers really to, um, to demand this in some sense of the, of the publishers and the indexers, um, which, which I think happens, but um, maybe could be stronger in some cases. Thanks, Dan. Um, I'm going to come come back to you now. Uh, there was a question that you you've sort of part answered in the chat from um, Susan Border around the best way of of basically handling mixed deposits which have both code and data. So I wondered if you if you could repeat the answer that um, you popped in the chat and maybe expand on it, and then I'll go to a couple of others on the panel to to get their thoughts as well. Yeah, um, so I, I think the reason that I was saying um, that it, to me it's better to have these things be separate is that they often have separate licenses and they can have separate authors um, and they can have uh, and they can be separable in many cases. And, and if they can, then I think it's better to separate them. Um, <clears throat> but in some cases they are more embedded. And so I think I think Dana gave the example of a deposit with a Jupyter notebook, which maybe has data in the same place as software. And, and so then things get more complicated and I don't really have a good answer for what we do in those cases. Yeah, Dana? Way in, just a little to say that I agree that separate is, you know, it, when you can do it, it's great. Um, I think part of this, though, uh, why repositories need to be big stakeholders in the conversations moving forward is that this is going to come down to curatorial practice in some contexts, because even when you do have separate um, records, so to speak, representing these separate objects, you want those things to uh, actually be linked together. And uh, when you have something that is a composite object, it's going to need different kind of curatorial care in the long term. So um, I think that they need to be treated as different kinds of problems in some ways. And we need uh, the repositories themselves to kind of weigh in on what the standard practice should be. Because right now, I think the landscape's really um, esoteric. Everyone has their own way of managing this. And so it makes it difficult for uh, anyone depositing software to know how their uh, code's going to be treated. Yeah, Just jump back in for one second. I was gonna just point out that I think this is one of the interesting things with software and data and other objects is if they can actually be curated um, by somebody that isn't directly involved in creating them, uh, which kind of seems to be the case for data, but probably isn't the case for software. Um, so I think that leads to some interesting questions. Yeah, I, I think this is one which is a real challenge for the repository managers, particularly at institutions. Um, where there may not be the effort to, to basically support a, a full separate curation process. And so I think um, the guidance at, at different levels will become very important. Um, if, you're, if you're a national deposit uh, research repository, that's very different from being um, the, the repository at a smaller institution. Um, there's a question that's come in from Lindsay Anderson about software citations. Um, so saying, are software citations created in a way that increases the findability of the software product? So could it help support, for instance, AI search queries? And have there been discussions about how software citation metadata fields can provide an indication about the reusability of the product based on the language um, or the method application? Um, 
for this, uh, I don't know if anyone wants to, to answer from the panel first of all, but I might also bring in Martin Fenner, um, who is the co-chair of the um, Code Meta Working Group um, as part of the work that's been going on in the community. Well, my short answer is maybe because our focus with Code Meta has really been to sort of sort out the, the mess and the chaos and sort of all the different ways metadata can be created for software to bring it together. And we have not had the strong focus on fair software. And I think there's dedicated groups that have worked much better on this because that seems to be where the question is going. So people like Dan can maybe better address the, the sort of discoverability and how it's people are working on increasing that. In general, I think software might be a little bit easier than data, which is often compared because it's just much more homogeneous. The number of things you can describe software that's much, much smaller than data, which is just like everything is possible. And uh, different fields have totally different vocabularies. And for software, that's mostly not the case. And at least Jake seems to agree. I think also there's been a lot more um, prior work on um, on this aspect of description of software, not just from a research software perspective, but also more generally from industry in trying to categorize and understand what metadata is required to to improve reusability. Uh, and a lot of that can be built on the the challenge. I think um, from from the question that was popped in by Lindsay is. Are we doing enough at present to um, allow things like tools to work on top of that, or are we going to have to kind of go back and all of the early adopters update the the metadata? But this is maybe kind of going away from software citation and more into the general problem of of findability and discoverability of software, uh, which um, I, I do encourage people to get involved in the Fair for Research Software Working Group as well. Yeah, and I, I, I mean, I, I do agree with Martin just very briefly that the, I think this is a much bigger problem for data, um, you know, which is a whole other question, especially the I in FAIR, the interoperability. I mean, you know, generally speaking, that are they posting something that came straight off the instrument or are they posting something that's in a format that, you know, nobody really knows what to do with unless, you know, they were in the author's group and, and my my experience is that, that that's a much rarer occurrence when, when, when people post code. Okay, um, Dana? I just wanted to kind of follow up on the um, comments on how we're sort of sometimes moving away from software citation as being the, the issue we're discussing. I think it's important to not only say, okay, well, some of these conversations get saved for these other contexts where we're thinking more about reproducibility and findability, um, but almost the other way around too, because in those contexts where we're talking about like software preservation, for instance, it's uh, often easy to not think about citation because it's seen as like this very niche um, issue, but the, the channel goes both ways. Yeah. Stefan. I was just going to add that on the other hand, um, software as compared to data has a different kind of issue, which isn't even in the natural scope of the product, so to speak, which is the, the bare metal that you actually need to be able to run the software later on. And we've had huge issues around this in, in linguistics where there were most tooling around, which, you you know, I mean, the software was well engineered and you should theoretically be able to, to run it, but it, it relied on a specific type of machine. So there was no way you could actually reuse it. I think there is still one machine in Germany that can, that can run it. Um, on the other hand, uh, coming back to software citation, I'm not even sure if we have agreed on what we mean when we say software citation, because it has so many different aspects. I mean, you, you have the findability issue, you have the credit aspect, which is something that CFF uh, focuses on, uh, for example, and a plethora yeah, right. of other things. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Um, amazingly, we are already at uh, five minutes to the hour, and so we're, we're going to be wrapping up this session. And I'm going to ask everyone uh, to um, answer one final question, but I'm going to, I'm going to let the uh, panelists do this first, so that you've got some idea of maybe what you'd like to do as well. 
Um, and that is basically um, what one thing will you do to support software citation in 2022? So for, for the panelists, this is a uh, chance for you to suggest what you'd like people to do. So um, I'll go uh, to um, I'll go to Dana first. What one thing would you uh, what one thing will you be doing to help support software citation and what, what would you like people to do? Well, I will be hosting the workshop that I described, and I would really like people who are thinking of citing software to think really critically about the, the identifier they're using to cite software um, and to not uh, necessarily just use the first link you're able to find, so to speak, um, but to think about uh, the, permanent, the permanence of that link. So permalinks, please. Thanks, Dana. Um, Jake, what, what are you going to be doing and what would you like people to do? Um, I want to publicize the JATS for R standard and, and hope that it's widely adopted across all of the publishers that participated because I think we worked hard and I think um, it, it's going to be tremendously useful. Thank you. Um, uh, Stefan? That's a simple one. Um, I just want everybody to put a citation metadata file in their source code repositories. Melissa, how about you? Um, okay, gosh, this is quite difficult because I've just swapped jobs. So I'm no longer a publisher, so I, can't, I won't be able to kind of carry on from that um, route. But I, I think like Jake, I'll be um, promoting the Jats for our um, work and also maybe just seeing whether it's having any effect in all the masses of data that I have in the, at the place I work now. <clears throat> Thanks, Melissa. And finally, uh, Dan, what would what will you be doing? What would you like people to do? And as Dan is speaking, please do go to that link and start putting in your own um, suggestions about what you'll be doing in 2022 to help support software citation. Yeah, I, I think one is a remarkably small number that I'm not sure that I can answer. Um, but I, I, I suppose uh, maybe um, maybe actually just trying to work more with people at my own institution at NCSA here at Illinois um, and trying to make sure that the software that we are producing is made citable um, and that we ourselves in our own papers do a better job of citing our own software and other people's software as, a, as examples. So because it is getting near to the end of the year, um, I will give you one more, Dan. So if there's a if there's another thing you'd like people to do, what would it be? Um, I, I so this isn't really people, but this is kind of following on what um, Stefan was saying is that I think we collectively um, need to figure out how to answer this question that Guru has asked and and, and not just say that authors should only cite the software that they've used and not the things that it depends on, but figure out how when we publish software, when we create software, we can list the dependencies of the software there and have those citations and, and actually build the, the, the trees that we need to understand the, the entire chains of, of dependencies and, and, uh, and credit. That's a wonderful thought to, to finish on. Um, I'd like to thank uh, all of the speakers.